Well, this morning, uh, we're continuing uh, in uh, Exodus, our series in Exodus. Uh, if you want to turn there, we're going to be uh, at the end of chapter 25. And as we've been looking uh, in this chapter so far, we've been seeing uh, just the design of the tabernacle, specifically the, the furnishings in the tabernacle. Just to kind of give you, uh, kind of to reset the setting for you, as we've seen, uh, Moses was on the mountain with God. He came down, kind of, uh, he gave the covenant uh, to the people. He spoke it to them. They affirmed it. Then he goes back up on the mountain. And this is where uh, we see Moses on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. This is where Moses will receive the actual tablets of stone with the, with the, the Ten Commandments written on them. And uh, God is giving Moses right now this design for uh, this tabernacle, this, this portable temple, if you will. And uh, as we've looked at it, we've kind of started, the design has started on the innermost part of the tabernacle, where God has given instructions to Moses for the construction of uh, what we call the Ark of the Covenant. He's gone out from there into uh, the outer room, what's called the holy place, and given Moses the instruction for the table of, of showbread that uh, we looked at last week. And then this week, uh, we look at another piece of furniture in this room, in this, the holy place, which is called the lampstand. So if you look with me in Exodus 25, we'll begin with verse 31 and read about the lampstand. You shall make a lampstand of pure gold. The lampstand shall be made of hammered work. Its base, its stem, its cups, its calyxes, and its flowers shall be of one piece with it. And there shall be six branches going out of its sides, three branches of the lampstand uh, out of one side of it, and three branches of the lampstand out of the other side of it. Three cups made like almond blossoms, each with calyx and flower on one branch, and three cups made like almond blossoms, each with calyx and flower on the other branch. So for the six branches going out of the lampstand, and on the lampstand itself, there shall be four cups made like almond blossoms with their calyxes and flowers, and a calyx of one piece with it under each pair of the six branches going out from the lampstand. Their calyxes and their branches shall be of one piece with it. The whole of it, a single piece of hammered work of pure gold. You shall make seven lamps for it, and the lamp shall be set up so as to give light on the space in front of it. Its tongs and its trays shall be of pure gold. It shall be made with all these utensils out of a talent of pure gold. And see that you make them after the pattern for them, which is being shown you on the mountain. As you read through a passage like that, and we're kind of repeating the same words over and over again. Uh, if, you're, if you're like me, when I was a kid, just kind of doing my daily Bible reading, I'd get to sections like this, and it's kind of like, you know, so-and-so begat so-and-so, and so-and-so begat so-and-so. And, -so, and you're, my immediate impression as a kid was, this probably could be skipped. This doesn't seem all that practical or relevant to me. And I, I get a little bit of that in here. Uh, this branch or this calyx, this flower, and okay, there has to be a faster way to say that, right? So I want to look today just at kind of the, the obvious practical purpose of the lampstand, but there is so much more uh, to, to the lampstand as we have seen with the table of showbread, as we've seen with the Ark of the Covenant and the mercy seat that covered it. There is so much more. So we, uh, with the Ark of the Covenant, with the table of the bread, we're given uh, dimensions. Granted, we don't know exactly what those were uh, since they're using uh, measurements that we don't use these days, but we have rough estimates. But with the lampstand, we're not given uh, any actual dimensions. All we're told is the weight uh, of the lampstand uh, that the, the material that it was made out of. Verse 39 says that it was to be made out of a talent of pure gold. Now, if you're like me and you're wondering what a talent is, uh, well, it's equal to 3,000 shekels. Uh, yeah. 
No. Uh, these, of course, are ancient measurements. We don't use talents or shekels these days. I don't know what 3,000 shekels is, but the, the estimate is that is about 75 pounds. So one talent was 75 pounds. So based on this weight, and I think also based on the fact that there's no table designed for this lamp, it is not a simple like, candelabra that the priest would carry in a hand. This is a large lampstand. It's probably maybe at a minimum three feet. Some people estimate up to five to six feet tall. And I, I think uh, the uh, historian Josephus said that the one of, in his day was about five feet tall and three and a half uh, feet wide. So it's a, it's a large, uh, large lampstand. Uh, unlike the ark and the table, those were designed with wood overlaid with gold. Uh, the lampstand uh, was fashioned much more like the mercy seat that sat on top of the Ark of the Covenant. It's a, a lump of gold of some sort that the craftsman would actually hammer out, beat out into the shape that uh, was desired. We've seen uh, other items in the temple, uh, such as uh, the rings that, would, uh, that the pole would go through for the Ark of the Covenant. Those, they would use kind of what you would think of with uh, working gold, or you'd melt, melt the gold down and you'd pour it into a mold, uh, and that's how they made those things. But this is not how uh, the lampstand was made. It was painstakingly shaped by the uh, craftsman's hammer. Now, there were seven cups or bowls on the lampstand designed to hold seven oil lamps. The uh, individual lamps would have had that same kind of bowl shape, so it could kind of sit down into that socket. Uh, if, you, if you Google bronze age oil lamp, you'll probably get a pretty good idea of what this looked like. A bowl with one side kind of rolled up and pinched into a bit of a spout. So what would happen is you'd fill that bowl with, with oil, and you'd put the wick through the spout. It would soak up the oil. You'd light the other end that stuck out of the, out of the spout, and that would be your lamp. So you're continuing, continually kind of replacing the, the, the wick, filling up the oil uh, to keep that lit. Then that lamp would just sit down into the socket uh, of the uh, lampstand, and the instruction that was given was, you know, even though you can move them around in the socket, the lamps were to be pointed toward the middle of the room, really pointed uh, toward what stood opposite of it, which was the table with the bread on it. So the obvious practical purpose of this lampstand and its lamps was light. You know, it, they needed light in this space. As we'll look at next week in the design of the coverings for the tabernacle, there, are, there were four layers of material that covered the tabernacle. There are no windows in the tabernacle. So it would have, been, would have been a dark space. Perhaps during daylight hours, a little bit of light may have crept in through the, through the curtain that hung on the, uh, to the, the entryway to the tabernacle itself. But probably even during those hours, they, they needed light. So the practical purpose was to give light to the space so the priests could perform their duties within the temple, within the tabernacle. But... As we know, the elements uh, of the tabernacle don't serve a merely practical purpose. Uh, as we have uh, been given ourselves sacraments, we observe baptism and communion. The Israelites, they were surrounded by sacraments. We uh, see this most obviously in the sacrifices. That, you know, that just stands out to us as a clear sacrament. Uh, and we saw last week, though, even the ritual surrounding the table of bread and, and what they would go through with that. That was a type of sacrament. So turn over to uh, chapter 27, verse 20, and we'll kind of see uh, a little bit more detail surrounding the lamp and, and how it was uh, used in ritual. So you shall, verse 20 of chapter 27, you shall command the people of Israel that they bring to you pure beaten olive oil for the light that a lamp may regularly be, be set up to burn in the tent of meeting outside the veil that is before the testimony, that's before the mercy seat. Uh, Aaron and his sons shall tend it from evening to morning before the Lord. It shall be a statute forever to be observed throughout their generations by the people of Israel. 
So that kind of language, a statute to be observed throughout the generations, is clearly, uh, clearly showing us a sacramental purpose for the lampstand and going way beyond uh, simply the practical purpose of providing light in that space for the priests. So sa- sacraments tend to uh, look backward and they tend to look forward. They look back to past reality and they look forward to a future one. So we saw with the bread on, on the table of uh, show bread that Ryan looked at last week, uh, a couple things there that the Israelites could draw from that picture. First, the, the Lord's provision for them in their wilderness wanderings. The, the Lord provided manna for them. And as they go through the wilderness, uh, the manna is provided. They, they collect it uh, every day of the week, except for the Sabbath day, which it doesn't show up on the Sabbath day. And it's just the, the, the miraculous uh, nature of the manna where it would, the, what you collected one day would spoil the next, except for that, the manna that you collected on Friday, it would last through the Sabbath. So it was clearly a gift from God, clearly showing God's provision. So the bread looks back to that because once they cross into the promised land, guess what stopped being provided for them? Manna. It just stopped. They were now in the promised land. There was no need for it uh, in their, uh, um, being in the, in the promised land at this point. But the bread also uh, pointed forward to God's continued provision. Uh, it, it pointed forward to uh, them having a type of fellowship with God, where as this is the dwelling place of God, his table is set there with bread, and the priests themselves uh, were able to eat the bread. But it ultimately is fulfilled in Christ, as we saw. Christ, who is the bread of life, and who is our only access to fellowship with God. If we think of this uh, kind of uh, backward-forward idea with sacraments, we think of our own communion. You can look back to the Passover, where we kind of have that original picture of, uh, of this type of communion, where the, the Passover lamb was killed, its blood painted on the doorposts, and, and then the family would come together, and they would eat, the, they would eat that lamb they would partake in it, kind of showing that the unity between the animal that gave its life for the family and that family who reaped the benefits of the lamb's death. But of course, uh, communion as well has its perfect fulfillment in Christ. And when we observe, when we celebrate communion, we say we, we do it in remembrance the past act, remembrance of Christ until he comes again, that future aspect where we're looking forward to him coming again, the future reality of our salvation. So as we consider the lampstand as a sacrament, let's look at some of its design elements uh, to see what it points to. So if you look back at chapter 25, this passage that that I just read uh, about the lampstand, You kind of skim through it, and you'll notice uh, the use of the words to describe the lampstand. From its base, a stem or a stalk would rise. From the central stalk, six branches would come forth, three on one side and three on the other. On both the stalk and the branches, there were to be almond blossoms. And with the calyx, that's the the structure that holds a flower, with with both the calyx and the flower itself. The lampstand was designed to resemble a tree. And it was clearly a living tree as the buds on the main stalk formed the beginning of each branch and ultimately bore the the fruit of a flame at the end of each branch. Now, we've already discussed uh, previously in the series how the tabernacle uh, was a place where God condescended to dwell with man and pictured uh, for the people of Israel a temporary Eden. And as the priests, the mediators of, uh, between God and man, entered this picture of the Garden of Eden, they would immediately be greeted with a lampstand that pointed them back to the tree of life. Now, we'll look at this more next week uh, because next week we talk about the actual structure 
of, of this tent, of this tabernacle. But when, when God removed Adam and Eve from the garden after their sin, he specifically removed them. It says uh, he removed them out of the garden, and at the east side of the garden, he set a cherubim and a flaming sword to guard the access to the tree of life. Well, the tabernacle, whenever they set the tabernacle up, the, the entrance to the most holy place, the entrance to the holy place, and the entrance to the courtyard were all on the east side of the tabernacle. So when the priests would come through uh, to enter into the tabernacle, they would go enter through going west as Adam and Eve would have, if they, if they could go back to the garden, they would go west into the garden. Not only that, but the priest would enter into a room that that inner lining would be lit by this lamp. And what was all over this lining, what was sewn into its fabric? Pictures of cherubim all over it. So the priest would enter this tabernacle, this temporary Eden, they would see the cherubim. They would see this lampstand that resembled a tree, the tree of life. Now, as a sacrament, the lampstand also points to future realities. Uh, it's important to remember, as Moses received the uh, instructions from God on the mountain, uh, it says, even in our uh, section here, verse 40, says, and see that you make them, after the pat- uh, make them after the pattern for them, which is being shown to you on the mountain. So God's giving a verbal uh, design, the verbal specs to Moses for designing uh, the tabernacle. But beyond that, he's, he's showing him something, showing him what we, what we learn to be heavenly realities uh, that the tabernacle simply models after. In Hebrews chapter 9, the author describes the earthly tabernacle and some of the rituals surrounding it. And then he writes this in verse 11, but when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. So it's not just that there's some grander tabernacle uh, in, in heaven, uh, but these objects somehow model, they represent the actual reality that is seen in heaven, and they chiefly point to Christ. So with this in mind, uh, look over with me at Isaiah chapter 11. Isaiah chapter 11. Beginning with verse 1, there shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. So we see here the same imagery of a tree. Jesse was King David's father. Of course, we know the promises established with David and that kingly line are fulfilled completely in the person and work of Jesus Christ. So it describes this tree coming up from the stump of Jesse. And what's interesting, though, is it describes the spirit uh, that is upon him in a sevenfold manner. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. A sevenfold description of, this, of, of the spirit. Now, John sees a, 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 a depiction of the spirit in Revelation as seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. Now, it's not, John's not saying there's seven persons in the spirit. He's saying He's seeing this description of the spirit, this seven. And that number seven is used all over the place in scripture because it's a number of uh, wholeness or completeness, a a number of perfection. So he sees the perfection of the spirit in in these seven ways and 
John with the, the seven torches of light. And I don't think there's any uh, small coincidence than that this lamp, this picture of Christ as this tree, that the fruit that's resting on each cup of the seven, the seven branches of this tree are, are holding the fruit of this flame, the, the seven, uh, sevenfold spirit that rests upon him. So as you continue reading Isaiah 11, which we're not going to do today for the sake of time, it's clearly speaking of eternity. It's kind of the familiar uh, passage about the lion laying down with a lamb. It's speaking of eternity. And as we see in Revelation 22, it's no wonder that the earthly tabernacle would have a tree of life in it. Because this is what John saw uh, in the revelation that was given to him. Revelation 22, 1, then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, through the middle of the street of the city. Also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Now, there's another aspect of the lampstand that I want us to consider the, the priests were instructed to tend to the lamp throughout the, the nighttime hours to keep it lit. Now, when they first built the tabernacle and they're traveling through the wilderness, they were accompanied by the pillar of uh, cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. Uh, now, we don't exactly see when that goes away, but most believe that kind of when they entered the promised land, when they're, they're no longer needed to be uh, guided through the wilderness, much like the manna stopped, that the, this pillar of cloud by day and this pillar of fire by night probably ceased at the same time. So for those priests entering in, uh, and this uh, light that is being kept burning throughout the night, they're having this picture uh, of the pillar of fire uh, that gave them light and warmth at night. Now, as night fell on the Israelite camp, uh, the various families would begin to extinguish their own lamps in their tents. They would go to bed. But as Psalm 121 says, I lift my eyes up to the hills from where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. Notice there's no bed in any of the furniture given uh, for the tabernacle. God doesn't need a bed in his tent because God does not sleep. And this was to be a comfort to Israel. As everyone else turned their lights out for the night, the one tent in it that had a light burning through all the hours of darkness was God's own tent. He never slumbers, never sleeps. He's in constant care over them. This picture of constant awareness and constant care and comfort is, of course, fulfilled most greatly in Christ, who always lives and intercedes for us. So the priests were to keep the lamps lit from evening until morning. Uh, the, the language there echoes the creation account. Uh, you, you notice at the end of each day, uh, Scripture says, and there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day, and so on. Our time is oriented by the cycles of night and day. Our bodies and our minds need uh, sleep. We need to be rejuvenated. We need healing, and sleep is when this happens. Now, if you're like me, a lot of nights you you fall asleep uh, and you struggle to sleep because you have a to-do list on your mind. This is what I need to accomplish for the day for the for the day ahead. You finally kind of get through that process through that, but eventually, either you realize you just have to go to sleep, or your body just makes you go to sleep. Uh, you, eventually, your body has to sleep. Even with uh, tasks, ahead, tasks ahead of us. But while we sleep, our great mediator, Jesus Christ, uh, he, he holds the entire universe in, together by his might. He is taking care of all our real needs. Christ never checks out, he never falls asleep, he is caring for us. 
And as, as Christians, as believers, we are to lay our head on our pillow at the end of every day, uh, or as some see at the beginning of the day, lay our head on our pillow, going to sleep, realizing we are weak, we are helpless, but we trust in our Savior who never sleeps, who never slumbers, who is taking care of us. In John 8, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So again, as we consider what Moses saw uh, to be a model of heavenly realities, we see in Revelation 21, it says this, I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it, uh, gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. Its lamp is the Lamb. So this idea, this sacrament of keeping the lights lit through all hours of darkness even points forward to Christ fulfilling this for us. He is uh, the, the lamp that gives us light. Scripture also draws uh, a connection then between the lampstand and the church. Uh, at the beginning of Revelation, if you want to turn there, I'll read this section. Revelation 1, beginning in verse 10. John says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, Write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus and to Smyrna and to Pergamum and to Thyatira and to Sardis and to Philadelphia and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze refined in a furnace, and his voice was like the roar of many waters." In his right hand he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. And his face was like the sun shining in full strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, for I am the first and the last and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and Hades. Write, therefore, the things that you have seen, those that are... Uh, those that are those that are uh, to take place after this. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the messengers of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. And so then we have this question, does the lampstand represent Christ or does the ramp lampstand represent the church? Because there seems to be clear examples both ways. Well, the, the many... Uh, Many times in Scripture, the description that it gives to the church, it uses those same descriptors of Christ. And this is because uh, the church has its full being in Christ. We are united with him in his life and death and his resurrection. Uh, it's, it is no church that does not have Christ as its head. We are so united with Christ that I think this, the picture of this lampstand can be fulfilled uh, in both both the church and in Christ. To tie all this back to the picture of a tree, uh, Jesus says in John 15, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the wor word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you, unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. And as beautiful as the uh, tabernacle lampstand was, uh, and the truth that it pointed to is only the priests that actually get to see it. The priests go behind the cur that first curtain into the holy place. The priests get to see uh, this, this uh, lampstand forged out of pure gold 
with its seven lamps illuminating this covering with the, the cherubim sewn in. Only the priests get to see it. But what are we called? Peter calls us the chosen people, a kingdom of priests. We have full access to him. We have the great privilege of walking in the light as he himself is in the light. We get to enjoy uh, the, the warmth of his goodness and grace toward us. Psalm 1 points both to Christ and to the righteous, those who are united to him by faith. And it sounds just like the description of the tree that we saw in Revelation, the tree of life. Psalm 1 says this, He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither. We are united with Christ. We get to enjoy all his blessings. We have that free access through Christ to to enter into that holy place. And as we will look at more next week, even the veil to the most holy place has been rent from top to bottom because of what Christ has done for us. So we have full access to him. And we get to look forward to that future reality that we read about in Revelation where we will enjoy him forever, where we will uh, have no more sorrow, no more pain, no more death. And as we come to the communion table, we celebrate our Savior who is the one who says he's the Alpha and the Omega, who is and who was and who is to come. All of Scripture points to him and all of Scripture glorifies him. We celebrate uh, the great work he has done to unite us, the, not only to one another, but to himself, uh, so that even now and then also into eternity, we uh, will dwell with him. And that will be fully realized in eternity where we will dwell with him, where he says uh, that I will dwell with you and you will dwell with me. I will be your God and you will be my people. That's the promise that's been echoed since the very beginning, all the way back to Abraham. I will be a God to you and to your children. And this is carried through into it with Israel and carried through now to us. And we realize through uh, the teachings of the New Testament that this, this is the people who are united to Christ by faith. We are the children. We are the family that get to share all the benefits uh, of our great Savior. Let me pray uh, and... Uh, we'll enjoy communion. Father, uh, I just, I praise you that we have um, just can have such joy in, in knowing who you are, knowing that we are united to you. I praise you for giving us uh, passages in scripture that at first glance may seem odd to us and doesn't, they don't make a whole lot of sense. Uh, but then as we dive in, Father, I, I'm sure I even just scratched the surface uh, of the beauty uh, that is in a simple uh, piece of furniture uh, that, of a lampstand. But I praise you uh, that we uh, get to enjoy that access into, into your light, into your warmth, your comfort, uh, and that we have uh, such great hope and the home that you've gone to prepare for us. I just pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.